Good afternoon everyone. Uh, I'm a little bit slow in getting going today. I've had quite a lot of meetings at, uh, at work virtually uh, at the moment. So it's actually the afternoon when I'm filming this. Not that it makes any difference because you'll get this on Monday morning in Broncom as usual. Um, but we're going to look at Gerald today. Uh, Gerald Croft is um, Sheila's fiance and is outside of the, the Burling family. But what he is, is he's probably the uh, most extreme example of a, of a higher class, younger uh, man uh, in the play. So we're told straight away about him. And as always with these characters, start with the stage directions. Rather too manly to be a dandy uh, is one of the stage directions that Priestley gives us. And what that means is um, he's, he's well dressed. He's um, very presentable. Um, but he's 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 very much a, a, a man's man still um, he he likes women um, he likes to go out socially and it's this phrase I think that's the most important the well-bred man about town now let's have a look at a couple of things here first of all this this phrase well-bred um, what does that mean well it means he's upper class Remember that he's the son of Lord and Lady Croft. So that would have put him very much in the upper classes because um, his house would have passed down to him. Um, Lord and Lady Croft would have been established in, in the Croft residence for generation after generation after generation. And Priestley is very much critical of the upper classes here. So Priestley uses him as an example of all that is wrong with upper class men. Okay, remember we're talking about Edwardian society. Let's see where I can put this in. Edwardian. Um, in feedback this week, um, a lot of you in your essays have put in those days, in, in, in those times. Be more specific. We're talking about Edwardian England, just as you do with A Christmas Carol and you'd look at Victorian England. This is Edwardian England. And Priestley's being critical of what um, men are like. We need some language for, for the well-bred. Well, that's an adjective. Just about fits on there. And then man about town. That's kind of a metaphor, really, a man about town. And what it means is that um, Gerald is often quite sociable. So he's seen in the best bars, uh, at the best plays. He's seen um, in all of the parties. He's a socialite, if you like. If, if he was alive today, he'd be in all of the papers, um, at the right parties, at premieres and things like that. That's what it means. The well-bred man about town, that metaphor means he's sociable, but it also suggests that um, he's a little bit of a womanizer. Little bit of a womanizer. Um, and that in itself is foreshadowing. Let's put a little arrow down here. It foreshadows him picking up Daisy in the Palace Ballroom. So we get a lot from those opening stage directions about Gerald. Now, when Priestley is critical, he's critical of the upper classes, but he's also critical of those who have capitalist views. And very early on in, in Act One, we get the sense that Gerald is just a younger version of Mr. Burling. Look what Mr. Burling says about him. You're just the sort of son-in-law I've always wanted. Now, what he means by that is that it's a business proposition. Remember, we're talking about Mr. Burling as a, as a capitalist, but as somebody who puts business and money at the heart of everything. And why is Gerald the sort of son-in-law he's always wanted? Well, not because of his witty jokes or because he loves his daughter or whatever it might be. No, it's because he's looking forward to a time when 
Crofts Limited and Burling and Company will not be uh, in competition, but will be working together for lower costs and higher prices. That's what Burling says later on. So it's a business proposition. He wants to join the two companies together. He wants them to um, gain status in society. So it's about business. It's about status. It's about profit. Okay. Um, and again, we could suggest that those capitalist views are very much part of the context, the AO3, that Priestley wants to criticise in his play. So we've analysed that bit there. And notice here, we'd have done the same. Now that out of context doesn't mean anything. But what that bit refers to is the section in the play where Mr Burling has been told that um, Eva Smith has committed suicide partly because um, of Burling's sacking of her. And Gerald Croft is in total conflict with Sheila, his fiance, because Sheila, remember, has that, that sort of feeling about her. But they're not cheap labour, they're people. No, not for Gerald Croft. We'd have done the same. We'd have done the same. So look at the pronoun there. It's a first person pronoun. And so what that shows is that he's got sympathy and empathy with Mr. Burling. So he sides with Burling. Now, just while I'm squeezing all of these things in, as I write, pause the video, keep your mind maps up to date as you go through, okay? Um, go back through it a couple of times if you're not quite sure. I realise I'm squeezing a lot onto these, um, these boards at the moment. Um, but we need to know that he sides with Mr Burling. He's got capitalist views. We'd have done the same. He's got no sympathy for his workers. He's got no empathy there. He's very much about profit, business, um, making money. He's a capitalist. All right. So we know that Burling uh, and Gerald are very, very similar. We know very quickly that Burling has been criticised for his handling of it. Gerald is very much the same. Gerald, however, doesn't have a business dealing with Eva. His is a personal affection. And what Priestley is criticising here is how Edwardian men felt that they could do what they want with women. So we are in a patriarchy. Let's look at his relationship with Sheila. He's in a patriarchy and remember a patriarchal society a patriarchy is where men have control um, in society they have control over women uh, women have very little that that they can do in terms of power and we talked about that particular quote with Sheila but this is talking about the ring is it the one you wanted me to have that is Sheila saying there and we talked about this verb formation you wanted me to have and the verb there is that Gerald is in control Sheila's basically asking whether the ring is the one that Gerald has chosen the one that Gerald wanted her to have so even something that she's going to wear all the time something where her choice her preferences should have been at the heart of it it's Gerald who does that sort of choosing so it shows the patriarchy there. It shows Gerald in complete control. However, as that relationship continues through the play, of course we start to learn that Gerald has had an affair with Eva, or with Daisy as he gives himself up. Eva's changed her name to Daisy, and that's how Gerald um, initially gives himself away when he says, what? When he hears the name Daisy Renton. Sheila picks up on that. She's much cleverer, cleverer than, than Gerald, who believes he can sweep it under the carpet. So at the end of Act One, Gerald and Sheila are left alone together. And Sheila asks him the question, well, and we know that that question is, what is this about you and this Daisy? Gerald carries on being innocent. He originally just ignores her. He's in complete control. Remember, it's the patriarchy. We feel that Gerald's in control. He can ignore Sheila if he wants to. Sheila's not going to be ignored. What about this Daisy Renton? Now, at the start, he's been quiet. 
Then he denies all knowledge. Sheila calls him a fool, which again goes right against this patriarchy. But he then starts to try and belittle her. He tries to make her feel small. He uses a pet term for, oh, darling. He's trying to flatter her. Sheila's too clever for this. But Gerald believes, because the patriarchy tells him he can, that he can get around women by ignoring them, by belittling them. And further on, when the inspector comes back in, he wants uh, Sheila out of the way. She's had a long and tiring day, completely patronising. She's had a long and tiring day. Now the inspector turns on Gerald for this. You believe that young women should be protected from these things then. The inspector, who is Priestley's voice, let's remember, feels that women should be at the forefront of, of society, at the forefront of life. They've shown through the two world wars their capabilities. And Priestley is very much on their side. Um, so... Really, all of Gerald's attempts to try and get Sheila out of the way fall flat, partly because Sheila's much too strong and shows the downfall of the patriarchy that actually women are just as strong as men, if not stronger. Uh, and also in the fact that um, Gerald's not going to have the control because Sheila's strong and because the inspector is the voice of reason and the voice of socialism in the play isn't going to let that happen. And... With all of Gerald's attempts to get her out of the way, the inspector and Sheila together make sure that she stays to listen to it all. Now, by the end, it's Gerald, and we'll come round to his role in the plot in a bit. By the end, it's Gerald who drives the whole idea that the inspector was not real. And at the end, Gerald is another of the characters who wants to sweep it all under the carpet. So, let's think about this for a minute, where Gerald fits in. Gerald is an outsider to the family. He's not a Burling. Um, he is, however, a capitalist, very much on the side with Mr. Burling. Now, he's stuck here because Mr. Burling and Sheila, his fiance and his future father-in-law, are real juxtapositions, are in conflict by the end of the play. So Gerald's got a side somewhere, hasn't he? Does he side with his fiance? Does he side with his father-in-law? Well, Gerald is stuck in his ways. So instead of siding with his fiance, he sides with Burling. He's still obsessed by profit, by status, by business, wants it all swept under the carpet. And one of the things he does in, with Sheila is, everything's all right now, Sheila. Now, what about this ring? And Sheila, to her credit, doesn't go for it straight away. She needs some time to think. And I'd like to think that after the play that Sheila doesn't end up marrying Gerald. Who knows, there's never been an inspector calls to, but I'd like to think that Sheila was strong enough and sees the error of her father and her fiance's capitalist ways. We'll never know. But Gerald believes that all of that can be swept under the carpet and that we can move on. So his relationship with women hasn't really changed by the end. He still believes he can control them. His capitalism drives him rather than any sense of guilt over what he's done for Daisy. Let's bring up Daisy now. His relationship with Daisy is obviously the crucial part of, of his involvement in the plot. Uh, and what's happened is that he's met her in the palace barroom and uh, she's being um, slobbered over by Alderman Megaty. And we get this impression of a fat, upper class man who thinks that because of his power, and his age and his status in society, he can have any woman he wants. And Gerald initially is like a knight in shining armor. He rescues Daisy from Alderman Megaty. But in the end, Gerald does pretty much what Alderman Megaty does uh, in that he uses her. He uses her as his mistress, really. Uh, he uses her for his own benefits because Daisy falls in love with him. I became at once the most important person in her life. So she's in love. She's reliant on Gerald. Why is she reliant on Gerald? Because Gerald's giving her money. Gerald is putting her up in his friend's house. I think it's Charlie Brunswick who's gone off to Canada for six months. 
But why is that such a bad thing, you might think? Because actually Gerald's doing a nice thing there. It would be a nice thing if Gerald was doing that permanently and he wasn't having an affair. Let's not forget all at this time that Sheila's in the background. This is his fiance. He should be with his fiance. Instead, he's lying to her by saying that he's busy at the works. Remember, Sheila in Act One says, except for that time last summer, when you never came near me, uh, when you said you were busy at the works, that's a lie. Gerald is a liar. And he lies to Sheila, but also he's lying to Daisy. As much as he set her up uh, as his mistress, he's always got an end point in sight. Because after that six mo months when his friend returns from Canada, he's going to dismiss her. However, he still lets her fall in love with him. He still plays on that pretense. She becomes reliant on him for, his, for her lodgings and for some money. And Gerald allows that to happen. He's still controlling. He's manipulative. And what does he get out of it? Well, initially he says, I didn't install her there to make love to her. But inevitably, she became his mistress. We can read between the lines. It's a sexual relationship for Gerald. It's much more than that for, she, uh, for, uh, for Daisy. Sorry. So she falls in love with him uh, and he allows that to happen. Now, um, what initially attracted her, apart from the fact that she was being um, almost attacked by Alderman Megaty? Well, she was young and pretty and warm-hearted. So we might suggest that Gerald objectifies women. He's only interested in them for their looks. He treats them as objects. But... By the end, he gives the sense that actually he did have some feeling for Daisy and he is actually quite upset. I'm rather more upset by this business than I appear to be. So he actually goes out for a walk. But look at this. Why are those dashes important? Well, they allow him to pause. And those dashes are important because he is genuinely emotional. So although Gerald has done wrong by Daisy, and he's done wrong by Sheila, let's not forget that at all, he is actually feeling upset by it because his actions have led to the suicide of someone he had some feelings for. He misused her, um, he manipulated her, he exploited her poverty, but he actually ended up having some sort of feelings for her. And those dashes show him pausing. He's struggling to get his words out. He can't quite get his feelings out. And that's quite important there. But why does Priestley have this instance? Well, he has this instance because Gerald's affair, Gerald's exploiting of Daisy has in some part led to her suicide. Now, it was quite common for Edwardian upper class men to have mistresses. Now this wasn't necessarily allowed or accepted but it happened quite a lot and it was brushed under the carpet, it was kept quiet and a lot of Edwardian men did that. Priestley is very critical of that and he's showing by Daisy's suicide that women are not objects to be used, they are people. And uh, Sheila sympathises with that. And that's why I hope that Sheila would never go back with Gerald at the end. So although Gerald's upset, as he says, by this business, um, you'd have thought that he'd accept his responsibility and move on. But his key role in the plot by the end is that he's the one who reveals that the police inspector is not real. He says that man was not a real police inspector. What does this tell us? It tells us that Gerald hasn't changed. It shows us that Gerald doesn't accept responsibility. Whoops. Okay. 
really struggling to get that in. But Gerald doesn't accept his responsibility. He still wants to sweep everything up under the carpet, like Burling, like Mrs. Burling. He shows at the heart, he's still a capitalist. He's still very much on the side of business and money and status. And although he has had some feelings for Daisy, what's important now for him is to forget that, to move on and um, to show that this has actually been a hoax, that Inspector Gould wasn't a real inspector. And it's Gerald who starts all of that. When he goes out for a walk, when he's rather more upset by this, instead of thinking, I've got to change my ways, I've got to win Sheila back, I've got to be a better person, he doesn't do that. He sees a police officer on the street and he asks him, is there an Inspector Ghoul at your office? So he's always got his suspicions about Inspector Ghoul and he uses that for all of the wrong reasons to try and get out of his responsibilities and not accept that he's done wrong. So, just in summary, Gerald is a capitalist. He doesn't change in the play. He doesn't accept his responsibility. And Priestley uses him as an example of all that is wrong with upper class Edwardian men and uses him as an example of uh, the upper classes who need to change. They've got to be more careful of uh, how they treat the lower classes. He also uses it as an example of um, how exploiting um, of women upper class men were. Burling certainly will have exploited women, he exploited his workforce, but he didn't, we get no sense in the play anyway, that he's exploited their feelings, their personalities. Gerald does. He cheats on his fiance, so he uses his uh, position in a patriarchal society to have an affair. He cheats on Sheila and then expects her to forget all about it and he also exploits the poverty of Daisy for his own sexual gratification for his own purposes. He just wants a mistress and really although he had some feelings for her he still doesn't accept responsibility by the end. He tries to get himself out of it.